awesome. And Wednesday was even <laughs> it was another level of awesome. And every day I just feel like closer to Jesus. That's not what your real life looks like. Right. A relationship with God is two steps forward and then three steps back. And it seems like you're, you're, you're getting something and you're getting some traction. You're moving forward. And then all of a sudden it's like you don't feel like you're getting it all. Is that, is that, is that true for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's very windy in that way, right? And I'm convinced that one of the reasons that God has has created Scripture for us in the way that He has is precisely because the text in that way is shaped like our real lives. Like there's this back and forth. There's the two steps forward and the three steps back. And, and, it, and it takes these really, really winding roads to get there. Um, I, I, one of my favorite examples of this, I've thought about this a lot lately, is in the genealogy of Jesus. This genealogy really has some rich content. Some of the people even get mentioned in the genealogy, right? You all know the famous story of David committing murder and adultery with Bathsheba and all that. And then Bathsheba is mentioned directly in the genealogy of Jesus. I mean, it's like all of it. There's actually several examples in the genealogies, but I want to move through this part quickly. It's like, to me, the beauty of it is, is that you've got these really messy, sordid, complicated stories that are yet somehow always moving forward in a way that ultimately reveals Jesus to us. In the same way that God works, remarkably, in your real life. That's what happens. Ups, downs, highs, lows. Sometimes you feel like you're getting it, sometimes you don't. But through all of these things, there is a coherent story that's moving forward. God is writing a story in your life. And He's doing something really beautiful. It's just not always like, one day is better than the next day, every day is a little bit sweeter. It's more complicated than that. So God gives us a book that is as complicated as our real lives. Isn't that a great grace? <laughs> so that when we're struggling, and that, 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 that's uh, the that other little footnote there. I'm convinced that oftentimes the reason we don't want to confront the ambiguity in Scripture is because we don't want to confront the ambiguity in ourselves. You know? We don't. We want our lives to be neat and tidy, so we try to make Scripture more neat and tidy than it actually is. Richard Rohr has this great analogy I love that um, what happens when we read the Bible is much like the story of Noah's Ark. It's like you've got all these... Think about it. You, you ever thought about like Noah's Ark, like what a messy idea this really is, like all the animals in the boat, like what's that really like? He's just like we get, we're put on a ship with all these different voices and smells and sights and whatever, and then we're locked in with it. And you kind of, you know, you're sailing on the stormy seas, and you just got to smell the smells and hear the sounds and just kind of be there in the boat. You're looking at me so funny right now. I think it's a wonderful way of, uh, not anybody particularly, I think it's a wonderful way for thinking about Scripture. You know, we've kind of got to be locked in with the text and just kind of like, man, let it do what it's supposed to do. My addendum to this that doesn't come from more is that if the analogy is of Noah's Ark, I think one of the things that's so beautiful about Scripture, though, is I always think that, like, if, if, if it's a boat... The great thing is that Jesus is sleeping there in the boat. You know? So when Jesus is there, Jesus is present. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have to really wrestle, you know, to, to kind of get there. So Jesus will be ultimately revealed. It just, you know, it takes a really complicated road sometimes to get there. And I think, again, this is just how Scripture is supposed to work. Um, I want to transition just a little bit, though, uh, because, like, and these might seem a little counterintuitive, but if... The, kind of the first half of all this is about the ways that Scripture creates all this tension and ambiguity um, that the Spirit of God uses. That's what it means to talk about Scripture in a way I think that's faithful, is to preserve that tension rather than resolve it. God uses that, all those kinds of things. I do want to give you a couple handles, and these are you know, things at least that are, that are important to me. In terms of um, how we do interpret Scripture constructively so that, because it, it, maybe this is the best way I know how to say it, right? I don't think that we should prematurely resolve the tension of the text. I don't think we should make it easier than it really is. I think we need to sit with some of the things that are complicated. In fact, um, I'll say this too. One of the things that I think is really misguided about how people often read these texts is we come in as contemporary people with this assumption that there's no awareness within the text sometimes that it's doing things that are problematic. I don't think that's true. I think a lot of the texts that we have have always been problematic, you know? Um, going back to its earliest interpreters, I think, you know, that, that there's a reason that those things are there, but you know, I'm, I'm taking every rabbit trail tonight. The point, though, is this. I do think that we need some handles 
even in all the ambiguity, so that, because this is what I don't think is great, right? People will, like, say, read the book of Judges, which is a really dark and violent book, which will, um, in ways that can be very disconcerting, ascribe violence to God. He's the one saying, wipe everybody out, whatever. And then they'll read what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount about turn the other cheek and bless your enemies. So when I say, like, um, living in the tension, what I don't mean is, well, you know, Judges is, like, super violent, and uh, then the Sermon on the Mount says, turn the other cheek, bless your enemy. So, well, it could be either one. Who knows? <laughs> but that's actually not unclear, right? I mean, like, Jesus is the full revelation of who God is yes. and who, who God has always been. <clears throat> like, no, you know, you, you interpret Judges through the lens of Jesus, not the other way around. And I do think it's important that we have some of these kinds of like a, a, a basic handles um, in, in terms of just kind of having a, a foundation. One thing, speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, one of my favorite passages is uh, there in Matthew 7. Did you guys, those of you who were in Sunday school, do y'all remember the song about the house of the rock versus the house of the sand? Remember that? Yeah. Help me out here. I'm, the wise man is the house of the rock. I know it's awkward, help me anyway. This is really awesome right now. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. Okay, we can stop there for now, but we'll look and see. But then, the house on the sand. Foolish man built his house in the sand. Thank you. This is clearly the impromptu version of it. And so Jesus gives this whole language, right, about how if anyone hears these words of mine and they do what I say, then it's building your life on the rock. But the foolish man hears these words and you know, they, they don't do them. It's building a house in the sand. I'm really convinced that what we get through Jesus in the Gospels really is the foundation for how we read everything else in Scripture. And what is revealed to us specifically about Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospels? In my opinion, Scripture accomplishes a lot of things that are really important. But I think the Gospels are, are the only section of Scripture that explicitly answers the question for us, what is God like? Jesus is the image of the invisible God in Paul's language. Our Hebrews talks about Him being the exact representation of God. Um, Jesus gives us the full, complete picture of who God is. There's that great exchange between Jesus and Philip, where Philip is asking, when are we going to see the Father? Jesus, of course, says, oh, how long have you been with me? Don't you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My friend Brian Zahn says it this way, I really love. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. We used to not know this. We once did not know this, but now we do. And I love that phrase. The Gospels explicitly answer for us the question of what God is like. So what that means is, is that when we are reading any other passage in the Bible, anything like in the Old Testament, we're always reading that through the lens of how God has revealed Himself in Christ Jesus. That's the right way to read the Bible. I, um, I would even say it this way. The Word of God is the Word with a capital W insofar that it reveals Jesus to us. That's the point of Scripture. That's the movement of Scripture. is to reveal Jesus to us. This is, the, this is the whole movement of the story. And, and I think what happens when we understand it that way, and when, I was, uh, when I first started reading things about biblical interpretation, right, I was reading the kinds of people who have very rigid rules for how you're supposed to interpret the Bible. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's you know, nothing helpful here, but it's like everything I was reading, it's like, you know, and that happens a lot in evangelical tradition, is there's one right way to read a text. Ask the right certain contextual questions, and there's you know, one proper interpretation that you're supposed to get at, and you've got to make sure that everything's done in context, and you're dealing with the author's intent and all those kinds of things. If that way of interpreting Scripture is right, if that is the way you're supposed to interpret the Bible, the writers of the New Testament do a horrible job of reading the Bible in context. Because what you see happening in the New Testament is, what God has done in revealing Himself through Christ Jesus is so explosive. They're reading everything in the Old Testament. It's all about Jesus. 
even texts that do not in any kind of a clear way seem to be messianic prophecies at all. Like Paul does this right and left. No matter what passage he's talking about in the Old Testament, it's always about Jesus for him. He always makes it about Jesus, you know? And, and it's not a wrong move. Like if the whole point of Scripture is to come to reveal Jesus in this way. You know, there's something instinctively very, very right about this. So I just think this is always a really important place to start, is that, is, is that we interpret everything through the lens of how Jesus is revealed to us in the Gospels. I was uh, talking a little bit earlier with uh, Dr. Waddell, you know, about um, some conversation between me and my friend Chris Green, he's a great Pentecostal scholar. We have all these wonderful discussions about Scripture. And one of the things we've talked about now for years, and I continue to really uh, wrestle with this, and I, all these things are things I wrestle with. I'm not trying to act authoritative on anything. But one of the things that we've talked a lot about is if God is perfectly, fully, completely revealed to us through Christ Jesus, and that informs how we read every other text, I think that really changes sometimes. Like, um, you know, we'll talk about things like this. If you're reading a story in the Old Testament, this, by the way, is the real, like, thinking cap portion of the program right here. This, this could be challenging for some of you. But, like, say you're reading a, a, a text in the Old Testament like when God's getting ready to wipe out uh, the Israelites and Moses starts pleading God on their behalf. Or the same thing happens with Abraham, right? God's getting ready to bring judgment. Abraham is pleading over the people. Now, we read that. And the typical response often is, boy, isn't that awful that God's so mean here? And you think like Moses or Abraham was somehow like, boy, that they're nicer than the God character here. I would challenge you sometimes in reading those texts, where in a story like that, say with Moses, where do you see Jesus in the text? I talked this morning about Jesus being the advocate and the intercessor. Sometimes I think the revelation of Jesus that comes through the text is not always explicitly through the God character. Sometimes it's through Moses. Sometimes it's through Abraham. Oh, here, here's a radical idea. What if that's the effect that those texts were supposed to have on us all along? Is that God wants to produce people who are advocates and intercessors.